SciBite is produced by Jupiter Broadcasting. This is episode 46. Hi everyone, you're listening to Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly science podcast. We stream this episode live on May 15th, 2012. This is episode 46. My name is Chris, and joining us, like every single week, is our host. Hey there, Heather. Hey there, Chris. Hey there, Heather. Happy science to you. Happy science. Well, we got a big show, but why don't you tell everybody what's coming up? All right. We're going to take a look at new archaeological site concerning the Mayan calendar, a new use for breathalyzers, cancer research, exoplanets, retinal prostheses, spacecraft updates, and as always, take a peek back into history and up in the sky this week. Oh my gosh, but we aren't going to do like reality contestants vote off an island? Oh man, I don't know, Heather. It doesn't sound like it's enough distraction. I don't know. You know, it's funny. I had somebody write and say, Chris, really, you got to stop saying it's going to be a big show. But people, <laughs> here's the thing. I can't help it. We keep having big shows. There's tons of stuff to fit into every <laughs> single episode. Uh, I mean, you know what? In fact, well, you know. with that with that under consideration, we should do the news. What is our first news story today, Heather? The Mayan prediction for the end of the world on December twenty first, twenty twelve. No, not really. Oh wow, geez, I was getting pretty scared there. Yeah. No. Uh, also, special thanks to uh, Michael Enriquez, who, uh, sorry if I misspelled, pronounced your name, who uh, emailed in via the, uh, the form, making sure that I saw this story. Oh, yeah. Okay. So what is the story? So I, I saw the headline. I didn't do yep. any reading. But basically what I gather is they got like, what, another Mayan calendar they found that goes beyond 2012? Or what is it? Yeah. So what it is, is uh, there's six square miles of jungle floor, a uh, Mayan city known as uh, Zultan, okay. discovered back in 1915. In uh, Guatemala. All right. And like a tenth of a percent of it has been explored hmm. to date. So very little of it has been explored. A lot of uh, looters made a whole bunch of damage to it in the 70s. So, you know, lost a lot of significance. Um, they don't even know where the boundaries of the town are. So that brings us up to 2010 with some archaeological... Uh, uh, archaeologist from Boston University just mapping the, the city and an undergraduate who was along for the ride uh, was looking in an old trench, you know, dug up by some looters, saw some traces of, you know, red paint with black lines. So he tells his professor and he's like, eh, whatever. He's like, oh, well, hmm. I guess I, I guess I should go, you know, mark it down and we'll take, should, note uh, of this. take note of it, say, hey, there's paint here. And so they started, you know, digging a little bit up and say, well, how big was the room? And they started noticing a little bit more. Oh, really? Like, like yeah, what kind of more? They, by the time they excavated the whole room, uh, luckily the looters hadn't been able to get along to, to all of it. So they, were, they found a 1,200-year-old, six-by-six-foot room painted with portraits of a Mayan king sitting on a throne. No kidding. Like a red crown, blue feathers. Cool. Um, some other figures in the room, uh, some loincloth uh, figures. Nice. With some headdresses. My um, kind of guys. Yeah. A man painted in uh, orange wearing jade bracelets. Hmm. Uh, you know, reaching out with a stylus. So it's probably sort of the thing. And that's probably kind of a self-portrait of the person who drew it. Like, I'm going to draw myself up here. Drawing my drawing. Right. Right. Here I am. Look at me. Like, uh, you know what I always do when we go to family events is I always think it's funny to take a picture of my wife taking the picture. Yeah. You know, that kind of thing. I'm pretty funny. Yep. But it gives them a good insight, doesn't it? Yeah, it kind of gives them an idea of, okay, well, you know, what was going on here a little bit. Uh, now, the specific name of the king, it's been lost. Um, but they are referred to as, as like older or senior and younger or junior obsidian. Um, there's some theories that it, they actually could have been related. Um, that the, you know, these kind of people who calculated all the dates and stuff were very important to Mayan society. And this was probably a very, um, more royal, you know, upper end uh, location. So, you know, something but very important in the city. Really? Perhaps uh, a family member would have been, you know, this person, a scribe, or, you know, calculating all the day-to-day 
what's going on in uh so how did that work they were just so these these people that had these positions were supposedly like heavily trusted i guess they would be they would be entrusted with documenting and and those kinds of things is that is that what it is well the mind society would you know put a lot of emphasis like some um like some other uh, ancient societies on what was in the sky to predict what was happening in real life. Uh Okay. So they go through and they'd map out and they had calculations based on, you know, uh, orbits of, of Mars or Venus or Jupiter, you know, any of these bright, the bright, very well visible planets, the orbit of the moon Mm -hmm. when um, solar eclipses might happen. So all these different things would, you know, they would view it as, that was telling you whether calamity was coming or whether good times were coming. So these people were very important. You know, they were kind of the prognosticator saying, this is what's going to happen next season. This is what's going to happen next year. We're looking to good times. Everyone rejoice. Right. So people or, that wanted to, people that had a stake in what was coming, coming around the corner would go to these yeah. people to get their official sort of predictions or. Yeah. And so it was, it was very important for the, leaders of that society for the the kings and everyone else to be able to to talk to these people and say hey what's going on and what's this going you know help me look into the future you know help me prepare for what is coming up so i feel though like was but how does this solve the whole the mayan calendar ends in 2012 we're all going to die scenario yeah. well that comes back around so we have these pictures of all these people yeah and then on the north and east walls of the room uh they notice some uh, barely visible hieroglyphic text, some painted and etched, and they scanned it all together, sent it off to, you know, digitally stitched it together, sent it off to a ep- epographer specializes hmm. in studying all these mine inscriptions. And they noticed that uh, at least five of these numerical columns were topped by hieroglyphs that Mayan scribes used to record lunar data. Oh, really? So then they started looking at, you know, what's going on here? And the theory is that they made some basic calculations and put them up on the wall. Like you might have um, a chart in the back of a textbook. Right. Or the the poster on a a math class wall. Wow. Just something that they could kind of look up, get some basic calculation off so they didn't have to do that all by hand. They could just kind of insert that into their larger calculations of what was happening. Huh. So, of course they would. I mean, that's so practical. Why wouldn't you? Yeah. Yeah. So, that, you know, they had this thing to, ref- refer- you know, a reference right on their wall. So they saw, you know, a 260-day ceremonial calendar, the solar calendar, um, planet, you know, the planet cycles of Venus, of Mars. You know, and they each had the symbols of the gods on top of each of those, that you know, their own patron deity. Now, also near the calendar is a ring number. Um We've only seen it in uh, much later, later Mayan books. Hmm. Uh, it's used kind of a, as a backwards calculation to establish uh, base dates for planetary cycles. And the new astronomical tables uh, that they found in this site, 600 years older than anything else that we've seen. So much oh, older. Okay. And they suggest uh, going forward with these rings suggest dates more than 7,000 years in the future. So it doesn't. A lot of people know that the 2012 was, you know, they sort of had essentially seasons of years, you know, all clumped together. And 2012 was one that's kind of, you know, wrapping up one of these big groups. Okay. And so you know, some people were saying, hey, there's nothing else written after that. It's the end of the world, obviously, because Mayans knew what they were talking about. <laughs> right. In all things future. Um and then other people were like, well, you know, it probably just cycles on. But we hadn't seen anything actually that right, right. was there. Right. And now this is. This actually showed, you know, more than 7,000 years. Uh, they've, these kind of tables have only been known in like bark paper books. You know, they haven't really seen anything on a wall like this. Hmm. It was probably, it looks like it was towards the end of the Mayan civilization. So things may have been... Uh, in unrest enough that somebody decided to, you know, write this on a wall so it would be more permanent because books were probably lost or burned as they were kind of moving about and people were toppled and came up. But so, I mean, it probably belonged to this ancient Mayan scribe or wrecking keeper that, you know, needed a place to, to do all this stuff. Somebody 
important in the household, you know, to be able to do all this stuff. But probably they're thinking this kind of a room may not even exist in a lot of different Mayan sites. Oh, okay. So they just haven't found they, anything yeah. like this before. Well, they could be covered up. Yeah. This one really only survived. Um, this kind of paint doesn't do well in the bottom of a forest. It tends to degrade, but it only really survived because essentially the mines dumped a whole bunch of like rocks inside it and just sort of buried it over so they could build on top of it. Hmm. And so that is probably what, that's really what saved the paint to kind of go on from now. Yeah. Yeah. It preserved it. And uh, luckily the looters back in the seventies didn't just kind of half heartedly didn't undig this enough. So now we have it and, Nothing a little dirt can't fix. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. A little thanks to just thanks to thanks to that group just being lazy and piling yep. a bunch of dirt on top of that room. Uh yep. we now know that the world won't end in 2012. I know. Now, now I I saw like, you know, I went to a couple places looking at this stuff and of course there's obviously anyone who really believed it is this site is not going to change their mind. You know, they'll be like, "Oh, of course you found something." and they roll their eyes. But it, it's interesting because it was kind of obvious to a lot of people that Mayan calendars were very cyclical. Right. You know, it was very this group and then this group and then this group of years. And then they all kind of go together for this one section of history. We just hadn't seen anything roll over past 2012. Yeah. <laughs> and, so, and so this is actually showing calendar that, you know, calculates out beyond that. Which... The oddest thing that I think about the whole thing is that the Mayans, I mean, it makes sense to make a calendar that goes forever. Yeah. But that the Mayans were making like, making sure they had calculations for all these planets mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. going past, you know, 7,000 years past 2012. Right. Well. It's kind of like very hopeful for your society. Well, You're like, yeah, we're going to need guess this data. All societies so, think they'll always last, don't they? Well, of course, yeah. yeah. But this is also towards the end of this, the Mayan civilization. Yeah. So they're like, everything's kind of going crazy. You know, and they didn't just disappear. It was just a whole bunch of a long period of drought and civil unrest because of drought and other things going on. But they have actually discovered the written calculations saying, hey, it goes on for much longer. That was also the other thing that I found interesting. Is they, did, they just had the... They had the these written up on the wall so they could kind of refer to them. It's like, yeah. hey, yeah, lots of people need reference books, right? Or yeah, reference charts on the wall. And not everybody's not every not everybody can figure it out. Well, you can still figure it out. It's just easier and faster to do. Well, something. what I mean is like, that. Well, that's what that's, that's kind of what I mean is like it's sort oh. of like today. Like we will put we'll put things up that are sort of like a little helpful information. It's kind of like so not everybody has to be an expert on how to do this calculations. But here's a cheat sheet that the average the average Mayan Joe can use. Yeah. Kind of thing. And that's, or, that's fascinating. Yeah. Or in the back of a physics textbook, like uh, different formulas, you know, sure. I'm sure I could figure out this formula for this or that, but I can just kind of glance up on the wall and be like, oh yes, X and Y and Z. And there we go. Fill it in and go. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Very interesting. Any other thoughts on that? No, it's just sort of go minds and not well, be in good. the world. You know, that good. It mean, that means a uh, side bite will continue right along and all will be I good. No. Well, before we go on to the next story, I want to take a quick a quick brief moment to uh, remind everyone that we have the affiliate links over on the Jupiter Broadcasting site. And I sh- I, sh- I can't believe I didn't think of this earlier, you guys. If you're if you're somebody out there who's interested in getting the new Diablo game, and you haven't yeah. got it yet, which is probably not a lot of you, but if you go over to JupiterBroadcasting.com and scroll all the way down, you'll find links for Amazon US, uh, Amazon UK, New Egg. Uh, and of course, over at Amazon right now, you can get the Diablo 3 Standard Edition for $59.99. And if you use our link before you go grab that, and of course, I'll put a link to this in the show notes as well. Yeah. Uh, then uh, Jupiter Broadcasting gets a portion of your purchase. And so you can give Jupiter Broadcasting a little bit of your support while buying yourself a lot of Diablo 3, which is yeah. very awesome. Yep. And just think you'll, you'll continue to be able to listen to stuff while you play. That's awesome, right? It's, I know. It's, it's the whole circle. It's the circle of life in, in a sense. Yes. In a way. <laughs> so uh, thank you to everybody who uh, who does that. And, uh, and of course, enjoy yourself some Diablo 3. I haven't got it yet myself, but I'm waiting to hear how people react to it. Are you going to yeah. try it, Heather? Uh, yeah, it's, in the, uh, it's on the other computer. 
So have you tried? I'll give it, it a try. You have uh, no, I had work. Yeah, yeah, that's how I got it this it. morning, and then I had work, and then I had science. Right, and then we have science. Well, then yes. we should get on with the science. What is our first story in the SciBite News Bite? Breathalyzers. They strike fear into many. But now they're going to do more than just tell you how much you've had to drink. Okay. Hopefully. All right. What else are they going to tell me? So there is a new device that's being built. A single breath disease diagnostic breathalyzer. Whoa. Yeah. It's, it's being able to test for specific biomarkers, which are a sign for disease. So this is about half the size of a typical shoebox, weighs less than a pound, and you know, it'll have a little light on the top that'll kind of give you instant readout. Fail. Green, green means you pass, and it's not just going to trigger on bad breath. Don't worry. Um, red means you might need a trip to the doctor's office. So this, it has a little sensor inside coated with nanowires, essentially making it look like microscopic spaghetti, um, and they can t- detect these tiny amounts of chemical compounds in your breath. No kidding. And you can, they could just pick up just a few of these molecules, even out of a, you know, billions of other things, you know, that is in your breath. So they can detect uh, infectious diseases like uh, salmonella or E. coli, um, even anthrax I saw. So you can, so individual tests, you could, you know, do this quick breathalyzer for monitor, they're thinking, you could even use these for, um, oh, they are actually, yes, they already actually exist, exist so that you can monitor diabetes. Mm. Um, the kind of ammonia detecting breathalyzer to kind of be able to tell you when you might need a hemodialysis treatments. They're kind of being tested now. But now these sort of things are being, they're envisioning something so that technology will catch up so that maybe, you know, multiple, the, a whole bunch of these different tests can all be in one box. You know, so can you buy something and or have it there at the doctor's office where it's simple, right? Flow into this device, and it says, "Ding, hey, you should go." So they they must have they must have uh, made a conscious decision to make it so simple because they if it has the ability to detect these different things, they could have then theoretically done different lights for different diseases that it finds, the different indicators yeah. that it. But they wanted to make it so simple that you would then go to the doctor, right? Yeah. Well. I think eventually they do want to be able to say, well, maybe it is just go to the doctor. Oh, yeah. And then maybe at the doctor's office, a preliminary uh, box, you know, more sophisticated one might be able to say very quickly what they need to keep an eye out for. You know, maybe it's everything yeah, yeah, from yeah. lung cancer to, you know, anything else. Now, they're not, the box is probably never going to tell you at home, hey, we think you just blew out lung cancer. Because... They're not going to do that. They're right. not going. A box is not going to tell you at home what you have. Right. That's what the internet is for. And you freaking know, yourself out over the you internet. Go yourself out over the internet. <laughs> and I'm uh, sure how many doctors probably have to hear the. Well, I googled this online, and I think I have. And I bet they just go, yeah. "Oh, shoot me now." They probably recognize certain sentences from Wikipedia or WebMD <laughs> or something. They're like, "Yeah." Yep, you went to that page, didn't you? <laughs> totally. I bet you're totally went to right. that page. Yeah. Occasionally, it's helpful because you can kind of see. Once you have a diagnosis, you can kind of look at other things. But this is the type of thing that, you know, even in a doctor's office, they're not going to use it as a, you know, as a stamp. Here you are. They might use it to say, okay, I need to focus on this area. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Maybe they don't have to use a shotgun approach. Maybe they test for that specific thing. Yeah. Then kind of really analyze what other things are going on to make sure that that is, that's everything that's going on. But this sort of instantaneous you know, immediately kind of giving you an idea of, hey, this triggered, that triggered. Well, it seems like if, so if they can do, uh, if they can do, like you said, the nanowires can detect infectious viruses like salmonella yeah. or, or anthrax. So if they could, if they had uh, an outbreak situation yeah, where they need to move in and secure the area, uh, yeah. they could have everybody who need to get into the super secure area breathe into these breathalyzers, right? Before they, and, it, and then, yep, sorry, you got a red light, you're not getting in. Yeah, but that, you know, very, that kind of thing is very interesting. So you can, you know, essentially barricade off an area and then it's clear or no clear, you know, or, you know, if something is, you know, anthrax, something is put off or there is an industrial accident or something happens 
or something is exposed to a whole bunch of different workers in a specific area or a specific site. Then right. you can pull everybody out and say, okay, let's see who got, you know, exposed to this, you know, breathe in, breathe in, breathe in. Okay. You guys go into this line. You're going to the hospital first. Mm-hmm. You know, everyone else, you know, these people stay right here and then we'll, we'll kind of watch you and see what happens. And uh, you're, you're towards the back of the hospital line. But there's, I mean, you know, and then they could, you know, they're determining now whether they can be used for, um, diabetes or hemodialysis so any of these type of things that need constant monitoring oh yeah maybe this kind of a thing can give a better idea if you're on dialysis you know if you blow into this it's kind of an instantaneous hey this is not keeping up hey this is doing its thing right so you can, so you can monitor more closely huh. maybe you need it more often or maybe you can don't need it quite as often. So they can kind of tailor something to you or like you said. Right. You could have, if you had something like this at home. Yeah. Where uh, if, they could, if they could detect when you need to take medication based on the amount of uh, particulates that are in your breath, then they could say, all right, here, take this, take this medication home. And when you get the red light, take a pill. Yeah. And that might mean you could go two days without taking medication. Uh, but then if you eat something that's high in starch, you might blow a red that evening and you're going to need to take a pill. And uh, yeah. that would be a very interesting way to sort of uh, a, sort of a more dynamic approach to Medicaid. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In any of these medical, a lot of these medical advances that I've seen lately are very getting answers very quickly, which is well very important. And then also ways that you could use it to tailor to specific people, you know, for these infectious viruses that they can detect those. So, you know, you take your medicine and then, you know, you check it. Maybe it'll tell you, hey, if you go back to work, you're going to affect all your coworkers. Congratulations. Yeah, Yeah, it's a good, should I go back to work? Blow here. You know, it's like, "Uh, I'm going to infect everybody else in the office and they're going to hate me. Right. Yep. Or, yay, medication's kicked in. Now they'll just feel sorry when I look, when I'm curled up at my desk and don't look like I'm recovered yet. Sorry, boss. I can't come in today. I blew a red. That's going to be <laughs> Right? And oh, okay. All right. Well, if you blew a red, you better stay home. Yeah. Camera phone picture of the little red light. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, then I believe- It's call it in sick. I, uh, unless you have any other thoughts on that story. No. Then you know what, it, you know what that means. Do you know what that means? I'm going to try to- I'm get it right. I'm going to okay. get it right. You can do it's it. It's time for the Two Bite News. Two News Bite- all right so what is our first story in the two bite news section all right there is some new cancer research coming out there's oh, okay. well there's typically almost always some out yeah but there is a specific bowman burke protease inhibitor bbi because i don't want to say that three thousand times <laughs> They're showing some promise for preventing certain forms of cancers in clinical trials. What's, you know, there are all sorts of these type of compounds that they're looking at. But this one specifically is derived from large amounts of soybeans. Interesting. It, so more natural, which they're thinking, you know, it being in the traditional t- uh, Japanese diet um, might be one of the reasons that the, such low cancer mortality rates in Japan. Mm-hmm. Okay. So currently how they extract this from soybeans involves really time consuming, harsh chemicals, you know, kind of defeating the purpose of it being more natural. Um, of course, it's I mean, being able to prevent, you know, these cancers is very important. But mm-hmm. I think being able to do it more naturally without such harsh chemicals is also a very added yeah. bonus yeah absolutely now they have discovered that you can extract this from soybeans by just sort of cooking it in water about 122 degrees fahrenheit that it naturally the soybeans naturally release large amounts of this that okay. can then be harvested from the water and it's actually shown that uh, they need to be that these even after being extracted after essentially cooking out they're still active hmm. so they showed at being able to stop uh, breast calcite cells from uh, dividing in a laboratory dish. Really? Mm-hmm. Just kind of made them go inert in a sense. Yeah, so they couldn't 
spread about to any of their their neighbor cells. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So any of these is really exciting where you can, you know, anything that could possibly prevent or curtail any specific cancer or multiple cancers and being able to do it from soybeans, essentially, is... And what's incredible about it is soybeans are very, you know, it's a very scalable source of uh, material. Yes. You know, it's it's one of those things where they can grow a hell of a lot of them very fast. Yeah. So it's, that's, that's good because, you know, if it was based on something much more rare, much harder to, to get, mm-hmm. you know. Then, yeah. Or having a specific compound or chemical that, you know, you need time to create. You know, to be able these to plants together. these plants have these these enzymes in them you know so this mm-hmm. one what would you say was mgmt is that what it is that's uh, uh, the help- bbi oh okay oh okay yeah yeah so and it's it's just sort of like this bbi from the soybeans is just sort of one of these things that uh they think that maybe because for example the japanese have more soy in there mm-hmm. that maybe they just naturally are consuming more bbi yeah it's just sort of getting in their system yeah, so it's increased in their system, so it sort of helps uh, curtail the mortality rates. Hmm. You know, it's not going to prevent completely, but it's going to prevent some from some cancers from happening or slow them down from spreading. Right. That's awesome. The other side of this coin is that chemotherapy goes with cancer. Now, some cancers are resistant to think chemotherapy. Yeah. Uh, they harbor an overactive gene called MGMT, which oh, repairs okay. the cancer cells. Okay. You know, chemotherapy damages them. And then That's certain types of cancer that. has this gene that repairs the cancer cells. You know, so chemotherapy is meant to go in and just sw- sweep in and kill a whole bunch of stuff. Right. Hopefully the cancer cells, which will then, you know, that's the point. But, but these specific certain cancers actually can repair after that. So to counteract that, sometimes uh, they'll add um, MGMT blocking drugs, um, benzyl guanine, which makes, uh, but doing that also makes blood and bone marrow easy to kill. So it's kind of going back and forth. A lot of these, you know, you have to fight cancer with something really harsh. You know, uh, when the, you know, when the cure can kill you, you know, there's various sayings. Uh, about chemotherapy. But now they're wondering what would happen if healthy cells had this mutated version hmm. of the MGMT um, you know, that would be able to repair after chemotherapy. So okay. they made a P140K gene that they're able to insert into patients' uh, blood stem cells in, bo- in their bone marrow. So able, they extracted the bone marrow inserted this gene and then after chemotherapy right after the chemotherapy session they infused the uh, these tweaked stem cells from the person back into them back into the patient and within oh. a couple of weeks these stem cells had developed into mature blood and marrow cells with uh, 40 to 60 percent of them carrying this mutated gene which helped some chemo resistant healthy cells that were able to undergo all these chemotherapy and other uh, treatments. So sort of able to go in, grab the trickiness of some of these cancers that are able to survive uh, chemotherapy, you know, extract that, then go in with chemotherapy, go in with the, the other drugs that sort of sweep out the, 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 the cancer, and then use that repair uh, auto repair into right. healthy cells. Right. So you can again bounce back from from the various treatments. Hmm. There you go. That is extremely extremely encouraging for uh yeah. a very serious uh issue that uh, cancer is something that I feel like in my lifetime has uh, it's gone from something I hear about to almost you know almost knowing dozens of people that have, I mean, it's just crazy how many people now are affected by cancer. I just feel yeah. like it's expanded. Well, yeah, but, and so many of these survival rates have gone up. I have, uh, I had a, a coworker who had, uh, you know, cancer as a child. Mm-hmm. And it was one of those things where she said, 
I am so lucky to have been born at the time I did. Because 10 to 20 years ago, my, the survival rates were, you know, less than 5 or 10%. And by the time, you know, I was diagnosed, survival rates were 90, 95%. Mm. You know, so it's these type of treatments that come out every once in a while and you see, hey, here's a new inhibitor, slow things down. Hey, this is something that can dovetail with chemotherapy to help fight it. You know, you can slow it down, you can fight it, you know, possibly prevent it. But like you said, so many more people are getting diagnosed. Is that for what reason? You know, maybe they're just being able to catch this more. You know, but whatever, whatever the reasoning is, is that there's some new, you know, inhibitors. And I really liked the idea of being able to, it was encouraged by this, you know, chemotherapy resistant uh, for healthy cells. Because that is one of the scary things with chemotherapy is how it wipes out you know, so many healthy cells and they have to try to bounce back. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's very devastating. Mm-hmm. Um, all right. Well, uh, any other thoughts on that? No, I think we're ready for next. All right, then moving right along. What is our next story? This is almost sort of a history. <laughs> there was a M2F2 lifting body crash of 1967. Say what? Yeah. So people might, might have heard about the fixed wing aircraft. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So designed so that it produces its own lift. So there's no fuselage. Um, you know, so some people have seen a flying wing. Yeah. But that doesn't, you know, doesn't look very plain. Like just looks like a big giant boomerang. Right. Yeah, exactly. This, like, it looks like a big, or like a glider. Yeah, or a glider. This does actually have a fuselage. Okay. So, you know, NASA had this one launch. And, uh, what Now, when attempting some roll maneuvers, um, fortunately, kind of had a soft feel. Uh, it was kind of sluggish. The pilot couldn't really get a, a good idea of what was going on. Tried to overcompensate, lost control, you know, big oscillations. And he crash. Yeah, he thought he's you know, he was losing control, sort of thought he saw a helicopter, it was gonna collision, he was gonna crash, uh, went into a lake bed. Now, what made this interesting is that what I found interesting about this is that anyone who's watching the video in the on the website and in the show notes, you might want to go over and check it out because it might look familiar to you if you saw the TV movie The Six Million Dollar Man. Oh my gosh. That is in the opening credits. You're kidding so me. So portions of the video from the ground. They can do even, that? I mean, that sounds a little callous in a sense. Well, the man survived. Oh, okay. He totally, essentially just walked, walked away from oh, the crash. Oh, okay. And it's totally cool then. It's totally legit. Yeah. Uh, he, you know, survived it, recovered. Oh yeah, there uh, it is. There it is. Yep. Now, I think... Uh, after the crash, he had lost some vision in his right eye because of an infection. But yeah, it's right there. You know, in fact, um, footage from a later one was actually seen in there too. You know, the cockpit view is like, oh no, he's crashing. Yeah. And a good portion of that was from. That, that makes it fairly video. legit, actually, to be honest with you. That kind of makes that intro a bit on the legit side because that means that, uh, that uh, they, uh, you know, they were, I mean, that was real footage of that happening. Yeah, yeah there it is. Oh, this is great. I know, I saw that. I was like, that's awesome. Now, like in the Six Million Dollar Man intro, like the, the, the last like two seconds as he hits the ground, it's kind of, you're kind of apparent that that is computer generated. Yeah. But the general, you know, flying and oh, he's going back and forth. That was actually real video from a fixed wing aircraft. Now, does NASA make a buck back. off that? Do you know how that works? No, I don't think so. Oh, it's public domain stuff. Yeah, probably all public domain. Yeah. I mean, that'd be a good way to recoup some of that, those taxpayer dollars, that's all. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Hey, who wants to be able to use some of this really cool footage? Right, right. Now, uh, before we go on, any other thoughts? No, I just thought that was funny and cool. I like that one. Now, you have a note in here that we might have gotten light from another planet. Yes. Is this like somebody standing on the surface of a beach flashing a mirror up at the sky and we picked it up? No, oh. not, not, not quite. Okay, all right. Okay, so uh, 2004 discovered one of the first known stars to have an extrasolar planet. You know, via radial velocity. Okay. They're able to see the, the star, you know, wobble back and forth. And infrared light from some hot Jupiters, you know, these big gaseous planets. 
have been seen by a number of telescopes. Oh, yeah. And now the Spitzer Space Telescope has been able to detect light from a planet. From actually a super Earth. You know, so a rocky planet. They're not just seeing it, you know, pass in front of the star and dim it. Right. They're actually able to see the light, the infrared light from it. You know, so it's it's very hot. And so when it passes in front of the star, you can actually see it, the light, infrared light increase. Okay. And then as it passes out, you know, it, the light decreases on the star. Now it's just very, very minute amounts. But it is direct measurements of that planet. You know, it's not saying we see the wobble of the star. We see uh, dimming as it, you know, passes in front of it. Those are all indirect observations. Right. That's, because you know, this, this, so they, they're saying because this thing is a hot gas giant, it actually gives, it actually emits infrared light. This is a uh, rocky planet. It's a super Earth. Oh. So it's, you know, it's very large. Okay. Um, so one and a half. How is it getting, so where's the light coming from? I guess I'm not following that. It's infrared light. If you, uh, like have infrared goggles. Sure. You know, you'll see the pictures of, you know, little humans and things, you know, very, they emit infrared light. Okay. So, okay. you know, this sun, uh, this star is shining down upon this, this rocky planet. Gotcha. And it's heating it up. Right. Okay. So maybe one side gets super hot. Mm-hmm. And if it's very close, then it's getting very warm and it's emitting its own infrared light. So then you can look in the infrared and actually see it. You no know, increase and decrease. I think it was, you know, point a tenth of a percent or so. This is increasing and decreasing, but it's it's tidally locked. So one side of the planet is always facing the star. Ah, so yeah. So that would get that very hot. Inc- get yeah, that would get hot. it very hot. Yeah. Huh. But just sort of interesting that we've actually directly seen a right. No more tug. No more relying on tugging or yeah. things like yeah. So we're getting closer to getting there. So, you know, we've seen the star wobble. We've now seen, you know, as they pass in front of a star, kind of the dimming. We've seen these larger, you know, these hotter planets where you can actually see it in the infrared, increasing the light. There's also different ways that we're we're looking at these planets and getting closer and closer to, you know, these these direct observations. Right. That's awesome, Heather. That's awesome. And yeah. you know what? I have good news. For everyone up there, SciBite has just unlocked more content totally for free for you. Yeah. Uh, what is our next story? Uh, eyes for eyesight. Uh, handheld camera uh, processor images from, you know, you could sit on especially a special goggles. Mm. Then you can use lasers. Oh, okay. Use now we've got the infrared light coming back inside the goggles that can actually send information to some little photovoltaic chips that could actually be implanted in the eye on your retina. Really? Yeah, they're about a third as thin as a strand of hair. Screw Google goggles. I'm just going to put yeah. a, one of these contacts on my eyes and get get all the information yeah. right there. No, these are for people who have um, degenerative disease, like mass, uh, macular degeneration. Oh, okay. Okay. So the retina, the, gotcha. the nerves and everything are working perfectly fine. It's the retina who goes out. So, so this isn't they, something that's more like, this is, this is more like a more essential kind of sight stuff. Yeah, this is eye prostheses almost. Yeah. Uh, retinal prostheses. So these, you know, for people whose retina has for some reason been damaged or no longer can function, they could possibly implant one of these little chips. Yeah. And then use infrared laser to sort of, you know, shine into the eye to send that information, you know, and then use the eye's own nerves to get that to the brain. Huh. They're testing the system in live rats. So it's a visor? Almost Sonicata, not really. I mean, isn't it sort of, though, kind of that idea where they're yeah. using sensors and then they're using the optical nerve to transfer? I mean, that, that's yeah. kind of a visor, Heather. I'm just saying. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's not, you know, going through the temple or anything, but the interesting okay. part, well, the interesting part of this is that, you know, it's essentially wireless, you know, so you have the, you know, you have the photovoltaic cell implanted into the eye and then you just have these goggles. Okay. Sort of kind of ish visor ish yep. that you put on and then it records the outside world and it can send that information 
uh, right now using infrared light, little laser lights into the eye. Now they can use infrared because it doesn't heat up the local cells. So it's okay. not going to heat up the eye. Okay, so you're not microwaving damage. your eye. When you're you know, you're not going to be microwaving your eye. Okay, and but actually, how does the brain know how to interpret infrared light? Well, it's not... It's not interpreting the light. What's happening is it's shining on these cells, and that's creating certain... Oh, so it's illuminating the cells in a sense. Yeah, it's sort of illuminating the cells and creating the right electrical patterns to be sent to the brain. Now, there's going to be some sort of, you know, adjustment of this means this or, you know, that sort of gives you that. So this is totally a visor. This is awesome. <laughs> this is really great, though. I mean, so essentially... The camera is on the visor, uh, identify an oh object, uh -huh. and then they, using infrared, paint they an image onto the retina. Yeah, so you use a little uh, computer processor, paints a little image on the retina, and so then you, that can transfer to the brain and give you a better idea of what is actually there. That's awesome. So a number of these devices, uh, similar type devices are being developed and... Well, actually, another reason to use infrared light is they were testing over a range you know, these over a range of these, how how well the photovoltaic cells could read. And actually, it got very strong results or signals from the infrared it sort of spiked there. So it was even, you know, it got good signal. It doesn't harm any of the surrounding tissues. So it's very interesting yeah. in that this is another way to sort of to help and even, you know, use all the nerves and things that, like you said, that are there. Well, and it could, I mean, this is, I now I'm being a little silly, but you could mm -hmm. take this, so you notice, it, so it's connected to this image processor, right? Uh -huh. Well, that image processor could be connected to a Wi-Fi network and it could also be pulling in information about the things it scans and somehow also present that to the user. So it could I, it could be in some real senses you could go from having no sight to having some form of sight but also additional data just like Jordy did. And I know I'm being silly there but that seems absolutely possible because they do have a computer processing these images. It mm -hmm. could look up other metadata to go along with those images. <laughs> That's be, yeah. be uh, uh, so like right now for example on the smartphone mm -hmm. there's a Google app that you take a picture of something and yeah. it will Google it based on the image. It can you can use the image to do the searching. So the technology is out there; just all has to be connected. True. That to me, that all kind of, almost kind of gets into the the kind of creepier end. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. No. I, I mean, I I got gotcha. you. I mean, there are there are some things that are a little weird about that. Yeah. Uh, but, but I think people would look at it as sort of a competitive advantage because you know you could meet an old business partner and have it or a business associate and have it you know identify their face and pull up their contact info. I mean, all those kinds of things. I don't know. Well, yeah. There's that. Um, the way I'm looking at it is simply to essentially restore sight to someone whose retina has been oh yeah has been damaged. No, that's that's not, the, yeah, yeah for sure. Not the not the additional right. Uh, I'm just thinking down the road. Searching. I'm thinking this is this is you know obviously the most critical thing they need to do is that is gain, gain yeah. sight to the people who have it who ha who have damaged retinas and things like that. Yeah, but down the road. Yeah. Well, down the road that still creeps me out. Yeah, I, I want a little photovoltaic cell implanted into my retina yeah that part's really just so that no 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 not for no. that no 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 <laughs> thanks though i'll just stick with the google goggles i guess and even that actually it kind of has some level of creep to it yeah uh, all right well you have uh another story here that yes, I uh i think uh some people are gonna find quite interesting yeah i it's kind of a just added this as a quick mention just because I saw it and was actually quite surprised by it. Yeah, yeah. I, I am also just as equally surprised seeing it for the first time. Uh, Although, you know, the oceans cover about 70% of the Earth's surface. You know, we bring it up when any, when I say, you know, one of these oh, satellites yeah. is coming down, yeah. you know, asteroid coming down. Oh, my gosh, it actually hit land. But compared to the full radius of the Earth, they're actually quite shallow. Now, if you go... Uh, to the enhanced video version or in the show notes, you can actually see an image of an illustration. Of what would happen if you gathered all the water on the surface of the earth bunched into a little ball? 
and it is actually much much smaller than you'd imagine. Now I don't I can't quite tell from this uh, picture how wide and tall the ball is, but uh, for you audio listeners, uh, it fits in about in the middle of the United States. Well, it's yeah. not quite in the middle, but it basically consumes the middle half of the United States and uh, from top to north and into Canada a little bit. I mean, it's it's a yeah. big bubble, it but be, it, it's yeah, not. radius would be about seven hundred kilometers. Okay, a little less than half uh, the radius of the moon. Interesting. Very interesting. And uh, not as much water when you see it like this. No. It's I would have said the entire North American continent would have been underwater or something like that. Yeah. Now there is, you know, how much is, you know, how much of water came, how did that much water get to the earth? Um, is maybe some of it trapped beneath the surface? There are, you know, all different ideas, but the fact that all the earth's water could be you know, trapped in a 700 kilometer ball. And when you see that compared to the size of the earth, it kind of freaks me out a little bit to tell you the truth. It's very (laughs) fragile. Yeah. You see that you're going to eye your water bottle. Yeah. Uh, so, um, do you know if this includes ice? Chat room was asking. That's a good question. Do you know? Yeah. All of the water on earth. Wow. That's not good. (laughs) Let's, uh, let's not screw it up people. That's let's not let's definitely not screw it up because that does not that does not look like it would take much. I mean, it seems like <laughs> you could kind of see why like an asteroid impact would burn off the ocean, right? If it was so hot, I mean, you could see how it could yeah. just sort of st- all just steam away. Yes. Uh, all right. Now that we're all thirsty. <laughs> now that we're all thirsty, why don't we do a spacecraft update? <laughs> ah, the sci-fi computer always coming through yes. and registering a spacecraft update for this week. What are we chatting about? Opportunity rover, our little rover who's been on Mars. The rover that could. Yes, the little rover that could and has. <laughs> it's been parked in its little uh, winter retreat. Yeah. You know, with northern tilt about 15 degrees kind of angled so that it can get the absolute most out of the winter sun that it could. It has now moved. It drove about 12 feet. Yay. Yay. It's moving from its uh, winter resting location. So they kind of moved it, then spun the camera back around taking a whole bunch of images of where it sat for the winter, you know, cause it sat in, it did some science right there where it was. Oh, good. Yeah. It says here in the article though, that it didn't move in, uh, since December 26th. So the day after Christmas, 2011, yep. it hadn't moved. So. Nope. It kind of hunkered down for the winter. Now it's springtime. So they're able to drive it down a little bit cause there were more solar, you know, more solar activity you know, can hit the pa- uh, the solar panels so you can get more electricity. Yeah. So they to drive it a little bit, pan around, pick take pictures of all all the locations that they were, um, multi filtering images from the specific targets that they had. Now they're kind of kind of eyeball their power supply, you know, see how it's doing at a lower tilt. You know, it's not quite tilted as much to the sun. So mm. They kind of see what the electrical levels look like. And depending right. on how that goes is kind of depending on what their path is from here. Maybe they have to stay at a certain tilt. Uh, and I guess would the concern be that maybe it's got really dusty or something like that yeah. on the panel? Okay. Yeah. So, you know, depending on the winds, if the big gust of wind came and blew off some of the solar panels, that would be great. But, you know, this time of year, not so much. Um, so right now, until that du- uh, wind gust comes along, it you know, clears off some more of the solar rays, they get more electricity. It looks like they'll probably need to be, you know, working at least over the next few weeks with, uh, you know, angled more towards the sun. Somebody, so right now kind of limping around just a little bit. So, okay. So, so, this, so somebody's going to just move it through these sort of like progression steps to just, just each time as it completes something and be like, all right, we're going to take it to the next step. And it's going to do this. And if that, if it, if it survives that, then we're going to do this, that kind of thing. Is that what's going on? Uh, bef- not quite like that. They'll, you know, park at a certain location, do some science there, monitor how much electricity they get. Okay. Okay. And then if it's enough, you know, if they have a surplus, then they'll be able to drive and say, okay, down to this angle is now available to us. So then drive to wherever they want, you know, within that range. You know, and then if it's a look, then park there, analyze how much electricity they have and sort of go from that sort of stepwise process. So, but not 
So sign of what you're saying, just make sure that you calculate ahead of time. Yeah, and watch you know? the power usage very closely. Yeah. Very cl- so it, it's trying amazing. to get the last little bit out of this thing. Well, I mean, let's let's let's. It was a 90 day mission in 2004. Yeah. So I mean, he's, you're doing good. You gotta forgive him if, if he's if he's gonna yeah. you know yeah. hobble around a little bit. Right. You know. Right. Now we have more spacecrafts. Oh my gosh! I just remembered. Okay. 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 What's the, I know. It's, okay. What's the next one? I just got really excited because I just saw what the third one is. All right. So what is okay. the next? Uh, spacecraft update, Heather. Curiosity rover, our new rover, headed to Mars. Yeah, I can still send home some self pictures, self portraits. Oh, it was taken by the Handlin Handlin's imager on uh, April twentieth. So kind of just not outside, but it's sort of inside. It's a little tucked away thing. You can see little two green dots, which are actually reflections of the camera's LED lights. Yeah. You can see um, so out of focus cables. Yeah, yeah. So a couple of things. It was just sort of testing this camera out, but it's just sort of inside its shell. Take a quick picture, mail it home. Sort of that. So we know at least before it gets there, the camera was working. Yeah. So it kind of reminds me of those. You know, you're headed on vacation. You're like, hey, you turn the camera back on yourself and click, and it's all fuzzy and out of. <laughs> you still send it home because you think it's hilarious. I don't know that's anybody that does done. that. I think only you do that. I don't. Oh, okay. I don't. <laughs> Maybe that's just me. <laughs> uh, very cool, though. So it's on its way. And, um, and this camera it, is checked out. And it's only 45 days away. Oh, my goodness. 45 days away until Old it hits the Martian egg. atmosphere. That is extremely yeah. exciting. So the landing is uh, August 5th. That's right. So uh, we're going to totally be talking about it. So August 5th. Oh, yeah. Let's see here. And let me go into the show notes. Because you can vote for it to become a Lego toy. Oh, awesome. Yeah. You have some pictures on, of that website about what it would look like and sort of votes. Essentially, you have to kind of vet, getting a vetting process. So they have a design, then they make a website and Lego makes you have so many votes, you know, to say, hey, I want this to be a Lego. And then they'll put it through their design phase. But I thought that was cool. And yeah. along with its, uh, picture from uh it's sort of picture postcard yeah they uh so yeah okay so august 5th that'll be that'll be a sunday so we will have uh we'll have we'll have a sunday and a monday for the news cycles to catch up and tell us what's going on before our tuesday show so we'll have yes which means that my voice will have calmed down just enough (laughs) so that its decibel range will not blow out your ears right or my microphone right we'll still be very hyped up but so, it won't blow out anybody's ears. So something that I'm hyped up about is this. Yeah. Uh, I'm getting more and more excited about SpaceX's uh, Dragon, you know, ship that yes. they're going up to the ISS uh, space yes. station. What's the update? What's happened in this last week? Okay, so delayed again. No, shut up. No. Yeah, so it was supposed no. to launch today. However, it has finished all of the software validations. Uh, NASA has given it the full green light. So why was it delayed? Uh, another uh, software. Thing. This sounds like this sounds like a scapegoat. This software thing, I'm well, not buying it. Not buying it. No, I'm not buying it. I think it's. I've dealt with NASA bureaucracy. I buy it. Well, yeah, okay. I mean, <laughs> I buy that. I, I do buy that. There's something very small that could be causing delay. I just want it to launch so bad. Yes. So they have all the green lights. All the check boxes are there. It is passed with flying colors now. NASA says, you know, its target launch date is May 19th. Oh, so okay. the Friday after this show. Okay. And so by next week, weather, by next yeah, week, so only weather can can stand in its way foreseeably right now. And then if it does, for some reason, get backed up, it would uh, the liftoff is for May twenty second. So when we record next week, sci So that is the right now. It is either Friday or Tuesday. Okay. So okay, we will be talking about it next week. So we will have some sort of. I, I I'm starting to get a little anxious. I know. But I, I'm positive. I'm going to think yeah. that it's going to go off this week because next week's show is the year anniversary of Cybite. Right. I know we're going to be able to talk about this. That would be very cool, wouldn't it? They have to do it for us. Yes. So it, it, it's it's got to happen. I'm, just just I, for Cybite. I'm sure everybody down at NASA listens to Cybite. I'm sure yeah. that they'll. I'm sure they'll come through for us. Like, right? oh man, we we got to make sure that, that we don't. We don't jip Cybite out. <laughs> right. Exactly. They're probably big fans here, Mark. They're going to be excited. <laughs> yeah. About that. that or SpaceX. 
Yeah. It, it was on there, and they're like, oh, wait, yeah, come on, NASA. Well, gotta work you here. know, SpaceX, I figure SpaceX is already pulling for the launch day. Oh, yeah. So I, I we just got to convince those NASA guys, those NASA bureaucrats yeah. in the suits. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, true. All right, Heather, step in the time machine. Here we okay. go. Jump okay. in here. Ooh. Oh, 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 a little bumpy there. Sorry. Oh. Okay. That was my elbow. I apologize. Oh, okay. All right, our first <laughs> destination in the SciBite time machine that takes us back to this week in science takes us to 146 years ago, May 16th, 1866. What happened? Root beer. <gasps> nice. Yum. <laughs> All right. So a pharmacist from Pennsylvania formulated his Hires root beer. Uh, some say he discovered it on his honeymoon where, you know, somebody who ran the hotel served root tea, but he thought root beer would be more appealing to the working class. So oh. packaged it up in little you know, mixture boxes, sold it to housewives, soda fountains. Then they had to mix it in water and sugar and yeast, you know, to finish the drink. But he became a millionaire just for that. Wow. And that was really much more of a beer. Uh, you know, if you're putting water and yeast in it, that's, that's, you know, you're talking more now, it's just all sugar and there's no yeast in it as far as I know. <laughs> well, yeah, but it was, uh, it did only did so well. And then, um, mm. uh, I leave a reverend took it and took it a little bit farther and said part of the temperance uh, movement saying, Hey, here's a great alternative to beer. Ah, thanks. See yummy. The but temperance not beer. movement. Is that the prohibition stuff? Is that, is that, the uh, I believe so. I'm only remembering some of this. Okay. All right. Well, that sounds, that sort seems of, like it would be a good opportunity for uh, a product like root beer to take advantage of. Yeah. What, I, what was interesting is this guy, uh, Charles Elmer hires. Okay. He started off as, you know, just a a nobody, you know, working in this pharmacy uh, and then working in, started working a little bit, uh, sort of better job when he turned 16 and sort of built himself up, you know, saved up enough money to sort of create his own pharmacy. So I started from nothing, kind of huh. worked his way up a little bit, saved the money to get a better job. Then once he got the little bit better job, saved the money to open his own pharmacy. And then he was able to use... You know, that, so thinking, hey, here's root beer. Let's sell it in my pharmacy. From that, he became a millionaire. Wow. Well, good for him, I guess. And, yeah. you know, if that's what it took for us to get root beer in this world, uh, because without them, we wouldn't have root beer floats. And nope. let's be serious. Be uh, there's probably nothing more important in life than root beer floats. Yes. All right. Our next destination <laughs> takes us to 32 years ago. I missed it by just a hair. May yep. 18th, 19. 1980. What happened? Mount St. Helens. Oh my gosh, yeah. So this, not quite as awesome as root beer. This is in my backyard. That's why I mentioned yes. I just missed it by a hair. This this really threw my state for a loop. Of course, Washington yeah. State. Yeah. Um, I Yeah, I was looking at this and I was like, yeah, I, I definitely have to include this. This is you know a little bit near and dear to uh, Chris's heart and state. Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. So, and now it sits here with this huge crater in it. Just this yeah. ginormous yeah. chunk. Uh, it was like Armageddon around here. Well, I see pictures, uh, and it, you know, for miles and miles and miles, everything oh, was yeah. covered in ash. Yeah, I mean, so it hurled ass like fifteen thousand feet into the air. You know, mudslides, avalanches. So any ash that high up in the atmosphere is going to go everywhere. And it blew a huge chunk out of the mountain. A huge yeah. chunk. It's uh, it's funny. I have uh, on the uh, audio enhanced you know, with the visuals here. I have a version of it where it's uh, from the other side of the mountain. You can kind of get a sense of. How the mountain used to be shaped, and now it's just got this massive dome. Yeah, well, I mean, it. it was equivalent of twenty-seven thousand atomic bombs. Wow, <laughs> twenty-seven thousand. <laughs> that's not a real number. That's a yeah. fake number, Heather. You're no, faking that, me out right now. No, that's a real number. Wow. I, th- I mean, there was so much acid; eventually, circled the globe. Yeah, I remember hearing that. That is really that's that is something else. Well, and there you go. So that was uh, May eighteenth. 1980 and uh thankfully it hasn't gone off again although now we were now we worry sometimes about another big mountain we have in our backyard yeah. called uh, uh mount rainier oh we yeah never know all right well let me retune the side bike computer oh, okay so we can look up into the sky all righty i've got venus moving a little bit lower into the west every evening as the twilight goes on kind of preparing for its june 5th rendezvous with the sun mm. And we've got the, you know, uh, when Venus is going to pass in front of the sun, we've been talking about it Mm -hmm. coming 
the last couple of weeks. We're going to keep looking forward to it. Mm-hmm. Also mm-hmm. coming up is the annular eclipse on May 20th. Uh, it's when, you know, the moon, it was a little bit closer and a little bit further away in its orbit. You know, we were just talking about the quote unquote super moon where it was closest in its orbit. And uh, so sometimes when the moon passes in front of the sun, it doesn't cover it. It's not the same size. So it'll, just, the moon's just a little bit smaller than the sun. So you see this little ring around the moon that is the sun where the sun is still visible. That's an annular eclipse. That's coming up on uh, May 20th. There's yeah. some links in the show notes so that you can um, go to the uh, NASA website, even uh, Google Maps type interactive where Ooh, you cool. can click on where you are and it'll tell you Ooh, toys. this is this is what you're going to see. Oh, this, this is what time you need to s- it'll be there for you. Oh, this is great. So you can kind of get an instantaneous idea of, right, hey, me, this is when it's going to happen for me. Let me dial this thing in here. So let me zoom okay. in here a little bit. So, uh, okay. oh man, I'm going to miss it. Oh no. But if you're in Northern California, not only do you get incredible weed and wine, but you're also <laughs> going to get a great view or if pretty much uh, the majority Actually, of Nevada. Uh, go ahead and click where you are. You're not going to miss it completely. Oh yeah? Oh, that's okay. Probably, uh, that's probably the area of complete. You're, par- gotcha. you're going to see a partial. Yeah, mostly. okay. Yeah, when I click my state now, it gives me actual like uh, longitude and latitude coordinates or something here. Yeah, so... It's where you're clicking is that specific latitude and longitude. That's great. But it should tell you, um, it might tell you that you have a partial yeah. one at this time. Yeah. Par- this, is par- this is partial solar eclipse. Magnitude zero, uh, or uh, magnitude is 0.818. So, uh, the- and, and the start of the partial eclipse will be at uh, 5 a.m. Uh, UT. So and the maximum will be at uh, one nineteen a.m. in my area. So yeah, that's nice. So people can use this in the show notes. Click on their area of the world with this interactive Google Maps, and it'll tell them exactly what time. Yep. Oh, I like toys. Yes. All right. Cool. That's a good one. Yes. And uh, when again? When again is that? It's May twentieth. Uh, May twentieth. Okay. All right. Don't forget, people, because uh, we won't have another show between now and then. So, nope. It's uh, Sunday. Yeah. May twentieth. Yeah. Cool. Was that everything? I think so. We've just got those a uh, couple of big events looking uh, looking for these couple of big events uh, in the sky. Yeah, yeah, and of course Heather has links to all that stuff in the show notes. Links to everything yep. we talked about in the show notes. Just go to jupiterbroadcasting dot com and look for Cybite forty six, and uh, along with the downloads uh, links and the RSS feed, so you can subscribe automatically. We also will have uh, all of the links to everything we talked about. Yeah. So uh, all right, Heather. Well, great show. Great show. And uh, I want to say thank you to everyone for tuning in to this week's episode of SciBite. And just a reminder that SciBite is live on Tuesday evenings at 7.30 p.m. Pacific at jblive.tv. And you can t- tune in and star in our chat room. All right, everyone. Well, thanks so much for listening to this week's episode of SciBite. See you next week. <laughs>